Meeting is being recorded. Uh, welcome. Uh, sorry about these WebEx glitches. Um, we're working on them. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're going to start this morning um, by calling uh, to order um, and see if we have a quorum. So may we Good have morning. to order. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, President Ramsey, I will now take the roll call. Okay. Dr. Manzi. Present. Ms. Elliott. Present. Ms. Cadenas. Present. Dr. Lee. Present. Dr. McAloon. Present. Dr. Zapp. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Hope everyone's doing well. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're now going to take some public comments on items that are not on the agenda. Um, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. So could you open it up and see if we have any public comments on items not on the agenda? This is the moderator. We have opened the Q&A panel. If you'd like to submit a request for public comment, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen which looks like a question mark inside of a square. Type, I would like to make a comment into the text box and submit that to all panelists. And seeing no requests, would you like me to close the panel? Yes, please. Okay, um, now we're gonna move on. I hope everyone's had a chance to review and um, we'd like to approve the minutes of the board meeting of March 12th. Um, do I hear any discussion on it at all? If not, um, can I hear for a, um, a motion? I move we accept, Dr. Zaff. Okay, great. Do I have a second? McAloon second. Okay, great. Okay. So, we've approved and uh, the board meetings of March 12th. Okay, I will take your vote, uh, Dr. Nancy. Yes. Ms. Elliott. I will abstain since I was absent. Okay. Ms. Cadena. Aye. Dr. Lee. Yes. Dr. McElwain. Yes. Dr. Zach. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Great. Now, um, we're supposed to have a discussion and possible action regarding radiology and the DPMs um, from Dr. Derek Ball and Dr. Karen Rubel. Uh, I don't know if they're present, however. Hey, can I interrupt? This is Joseph Chin, Board Council. Uh, can we just uh, open uh, item four for public comment before we move on to item five? Item four. Oh, okay. Um, we need to open um, the review and approve of the minutes for item four. Uh, this is, is there this any? is, yeah, this is the moderator. We've opened the Q&A panel uh, for public comment. And we'll pause for a moment to allow that. And I will let you know while we're waiting to see if anybody has a public comment that um, I am working with Karen Rubel uh, to get Dr. Ball connected. He is having some issues. We all did this morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, if there's no public comment on the um, uh, uh, minutes, I, I propose we close the public comment. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Manzi, this is Brian Naslin, the exec officer. Um, I think it might be okay to skip item five and once the technical issues are taken care of, we can go to licensing right. and then right. come back to it, if that's okay with the moderator. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, before we get, we're gonna skip item for the moment. 
And um, let's go back to um, uh, our licensing program update and possible action. Great, thank you, Carolyn. And I would like to ask Andrea to give the uh, licensing program update. Good morning. Okay, so we'll start with following information is for the third quarter of fiscal year 2021 between January 1st and March 31st. There were 17 newly licensed DPMs. There's currently 35 pending applications with six candidates that recently completed their packages. And so far, 14 of the applicants came from out of state, 26 were third year residents from California, and 15 were third year residents from an out of state program. Moving on for, to renewals, there were 288 renewals mailed with 255 licenses renewed in the third quarter. Next for the residents, there were three residents added to the second year resident rotation list, bringing the resident license total count to 130. And do we have any questions so far on that information? Okay, uh, Brian is going to provide an update on the permanent license renewal. Okay, the last meeting, uh, the board approved <clears throat> the permanent license renewal what would be three things. It would be uh, the declaration of good standing. It would be uh, 50 CMEs biannually and uh, pay your fees. Well, we tried to get that into a bill, but unfortunately we were just late on it. So it's gonna be in queue for next year's legislative cycle. So that is gonna be our first bill that will go ahead and uh, <clears throat> start and see if, if we can get somebody to carry it. So that's the status on that. Okay, we have the three months timeline after that. And then finally, we have the applications for approval of the California Podiatric Residency Programs. There are 19 separate California postgraduate clinical training programs that are seeking approval of applications for residency programs offered for the 2021-2022 academic year. The licensing committee reviewed the applications and recommended the board approve the 19 programs at the last committee meeting held on May 12th. These are all the same programs as last year and there has been no changes. Great. Um, I have one question about um, uh, um, licensing your, when when you come to first license, um, initial licensing. Um, mm -hmm. The question was posed by Federation, if we require CMEs on that application, and I said I didn't think so, right? It's an initial no. licensing. Okay. Great. You mean for resident license, correct? Well, no. So once a resident's done with their residency, okay. right? Well, I guess that's the same license, or do they just get they get a separate they get a separate license, right? Separate license. No, but when a person now he's done with his residency and he wants a full blown California license, is he required for CMEs? And I said I don't think so for the initial licensing process because their residency kind of count counts as it in a way, right? Right. So for the first renewal cycle after completion of a residency program, that covers the 50 hours and the continuing competence for the first renewal cycle. And then going forward in the next two years is when they have to get the 50 hours from one of the approved providers. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so continue. Are we done with this? So that was the final item. You guys just need to approve all the applications and the program so that I can begin issuing and renewing the resident licenses. So the is, there, is there any um, discussion about um, the approval of these residency programs? Like she said, they're the same ones we've approved before. These are residency programs, not fellowships. Um, and um, I move, uh, do we have a motion to accept them? Or is there any discussion? So yeah, move, Dr. Zaff. Okay. So Dr. Zaff, you're moved to um, to accept all 19 of these. Is there a second? Second. Okay. What was that? Dr. McAloon seconded the motion. Thank you. Okay. So can we? Do we need the public okay. comment on this? Uh, this I, is the moderator. Remember, Elliot has her hand up. Okay. Just a quick question. Um, 
you know, being on the board for a while, we've seen these come through. Is they, the, are they the same applicants? Has anybody fallen off? Are there any new um, applicants that have come forward? I'm just curious to see what, the, what that looks like. I believe they're the same. I believe they're the same 19 that we've been see, we've seen in the past few years. And also remember that they're reviewed by the Council on Podiatric Medical Education. Okay. The yes. only changes yeah. has been some of the names. Um, so there's still the same programs, but White, Memor White Memorial is now Adventist Health, White Memorial, Silver Lake is now LA Downtown Medical Center. So it's still the same program director um, and address. It's just they had some changes to their name. Okay. okay, and with the changes to the name is, and I'm trying to look for the requirements, um, uh, when they do business as or they change their name, do we get notified of that? It gets posted to the C We don't get notified, to notified directly, but the CPME website lists all the programs that are approved for every state. And so on the okay. is where they show the name change and it still says formerly White Memorial or formerly Silver Lake, just so you know that they're the same uh, program. Perfect. And just from the business um, process, just because uh, I understand a lot of businesses um, during COVID have become bankrupt and uh, changed their names again to kind of avoid the, the financial Backfall. Is there anything that we do as a board that needs to um, ensure that, um, again, program director is in place, but any other licensing? Um, I don't get notified of any of that information, so I'm not sure. Okay. All right. That we have Thank anything you. to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So I think we have. A motion and a second. We have to open it up for public uh, comment. Comment, yes. And this is the moderator. We have opened the Q and A panel. If you'd like to make a public comment, please click on the Q and A icon on your screen. Type "I would like to make a comment" into the text field, and submit that to the panelists. While we're waiting, I have a question. Do all of our resident programs have the same renewal date? You mean for the licenses? Yes. So was... all of the current resident licenses expire, like always expire June 30th. Yes. Um, so once we finish the board meeting, I can start issuing and renewing for next year, which will expire 6-30-2022. We don't have any that have a renewal date other than that. No, they always get renewed in June after this meeting. And this is the moderator seeing no request for comment. Would you like me to close the panel? Yes, please. And now I think we can take a vote if we okay. have no further discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Manzi. Yes. Ms. Elliott. Yes. Ms. Kadanian. Yes. Dr. Lee. Yes. Dr. McAloon. Yes. Dr. Zapp. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, I think we can go back to item five. I think Dr. Ball and Dr. Rubel um, are connected now. They are. If this is the motor. If I could ask Ms. Elliott to please lower your hand so that we don't accidentally call on you again until you're ready. Um, I'm going to open the microphone of who I believe is Dr. Ball. Dr. Ball, is uh, can you hear us? I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I cannot promote you to a panelist because you called him, but I'm going to leave your microphone unmuted. And then Karen Rubel, I will promote to a panelist. So they are now available for participation. Good morning. Good morning, and this is uh, Brian Mason, the executive officer. This is item five, discussion and possible action regarding radiology and DPMs from Dr. Derek Ball and Dr. Karen Rubel. So you guys can go ahead. 
All right. Um, thank you. This is uh, Derek Ball. Thank you for allowing us to address you today. Um, and um, for the purposes of discussion, um, I, I just want to give a little background to the lay members. I know the DPMs know this, but uh, the DPMs routinely use plain film radiography in our offices for the diagnosis of uh, uh, foot and ankle conditions. Most often, the results must be known immediately for proper treatment uh, within the standard of care for best practices. Examples are fractures, bone infections, and follow-up after surgery. The availability of in-office x-ray is an essential component of our science podiatric medicine and practice and allows for the best practices thereof in the diagnosis and care of the patients. It carries a minimum risk to both patients and the staff taking x-rays that is, and ba a balance against the risk of a delayed diagnosis, they pale in comparison. Uh, DPMs, of course, pass a rigorous certification process to test as x-ray supervisors and operators, and we have a permit from the state. We renew our uh, x-ray machines and additionally. To most effectively practice in our office, we use limited x-ray techs uh, trained in the foot and ankle and uh, to perform the x-rays under our supervision with our orders, of course. This is a certification currently called leg podiatric. Until fairly recently, that Dr. Rubel will go into detail, we could send our medical assistants uh, to take a formal course, which met the educational criteria set up by Radiologic Health Branch, and hire a tech with that certification. Uh, the MA would then take a standardized test and have a separate certification with the state of California. They could then take the x-rays that were ordered by us in the office the practicalities of being in, in an office and seeing a number of patients in a particular day um, require that you have someone taking the exam with some alternatives. Um, what happened recently is what Dr. Rubel is gonna uh, mention right now. Right, so as, doc, as Dr. Ball said, what happened to cause a need for action at this time? And that is that the Radiologic Health Branch in California has been given the sole authority to approve training programs for the XTs and all radiology techs. They set up the criteria. So approximately eight years ago, the RHB um, Radiologic Health Branch changed their regulations in Title 17 to read that only post-secondary schools could offer this XT education. Previously, it had been offered by independent courses that were not actually a full school that offered um, other educational courses. So the reality has become that few or no approved schools offer the just podiatric program, which would have allowed an employed MA to attend in the evenings or weekends and maintain their current job position and allow them to attend for a limited time at an affordable cost. So the currently available programs in the area are a 1,200-hour, 12-month, full-time program, which costs about $20,000. Um, it's very limited number of people who choose to go to these programs. And, and secondarily, no such programs are available in L.A. County at any price at this particular time. So it's important to note that, to the best of our knowledge, Radiologic Health Branch never presented any evidence of harm to the public by XTs trained by a course instead of a school. In fact, we do not exactly know the impetus for the change. Um, there was no information exactly given to us. So what has happened? So, and then Dr. Ball is going to talk about that. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of a boots on the ground kind of guy. You know, I understand that uh, right, regulation and statutes get to be made, and sometimes they're made far away from the reality of what's going on. So. The requirement that we've been living with, and of course these schools have been gradually just being removed and even more so and much more rapidly under COVID. So the requirement has created a barrier to the advancement and education of our employees wishing to become certified techs. In the past, we would have our MAs and then send them off to school and either the employer or us would pay for it or recompense them in some way. And then they got an additional certification. We could use them in the office and they became much more valuable employees. So in a modern medical environment, as the DPMs know, that includes the, which includes the increased participation of ancillary providers, it is ironic that it's become harder to gain the specialty certification rather than easier. Consequently, certified XTs have become very rare, either through retirement and attrition, and or difficult to incorporate into the practices due to the financial and practical implications. Um, uh, in a, an MA who might make somewhere between 15 and $20 an hour 
uh, sometimes more, um, once they get their certified tech license, they're worth a few more dollars an hour. However, if you were to hire just an XT who has all the unlimited um, uh, limited x-ray tech, they want approximately 40 or $50 an hour, and many of them refuse to do any MA work. That means they're sitting around unless you're taking an x-ray. Um, and that's, it's just impractical. It's not, not uh, doable from a, uh, it's not financially feasible. So for DPMs and real life alternatives available are either the physician acts as both a supervisor and technician for all plain film radiography. Again, impractical. You just can't see the number of patients you need to in a given day that way. Employ other modalities with lower imaging quality. Um, or stand in violation of these rules, which of course we don't want to do either. So some of the other modalities being utilized are a fluoroscopy, which arguably is more dangerous to the public, or sending out these um, uh, the x-rays to a different area um, and not being able to review the x-rays immediately. So now we're seeing real harm come to the public because the x-rays are not taken immediately and they're not read immediately. Um, also, we can't take weight-bearing views um, if we send patients to an independent uh, imaging center because it's just impractical for them to do so. Our science almost universally requires weight-bearing views in order to interpret our x-rays properly. So our experience of this matter came through working with the board as a consultant and expert in that arena and also medical legal towards uh, many discussions with colleagues that what we see are fewer x-rays are taken Patients are referred to outside imaging centers with delays and ne negatively affecting patient care or alternative less uh, accurate modalities such as fluoroscopy or ultrasound are utilized. So we have a real danger to the public happening here. There's a de facto quality of care issue as plain foam radiography is employed less frequently and we're placing the public at risk. And Dr. Bowen to talk to our ask at this point. Right, so I wanted to mention why uh, we believe that we're bringing this to the Podiatric Medical Board. Um, and just wanted to mention that I served seven years on the, BP, we call the BPM at the time, PMB, um, but it was always clear that our charge was to protect the public. But it was also very clear that the best way to do that is to elevate the quality of the DPMs that are practicing in California. Um, so, in, aside from the enforcement side, there was the improvement of quality side, which we always felt was a very strong charge, and I'm sure that, that continues. So, the PMB has a role and responsibility in improving quality of care and best practices of our licensees. So, that is why we're bringing you this concern. And we have a situation where the regulation has been imposed upon DPMs by another board, another public entity, but the remedy that has been provided is no longer available. That remedy that had been the, the course um, or the schools that had offered the particular program, which is no longer available. So what we're asking is basically the support of this board in pursuing an alternative feasible training program for podiatric XTs. So specific to the foot and ankle, which would be that certification pathway again. So there are many different ideas that allow for, for this same conclusion. Uh, we don't know exactly which one would be the best, but we're asking for the help and support of the board in determining what would be best. And just wanted to mention that this, as before, would be a certified position. Perhaps this should, these should be overseen by the PMB and not a separate board, and which could be a possible fiscal positive for the board. So um, basically, we wanted to present this, what we're what we see as the problem, the background and what we are asking. And then we would really like to hear any questions that you may have. Um, this is Dr. Manzi. I have a question. Do you know what the dentists do? What is their rules? Well, I, I know that um, Brian can give you this in a little more detail, too, and certainly your attorney for the board, because that has been looked into. But um, the, the bottom line is they created a situation and, a, and an alternative that is really, really difficult for us to duplicate. Um, there is really strong opposition to any sort of duplication of what they do. Uh, they get their x-ray certification within being a dental hygienist or assistant.
I hope that was clear. I, I went to my ear, nose, and throat doctor, and uh, they now have a CT scan in their office, and they have technicians that their office staff runs the CT scan. They do not have any separate licensure. I'm not sure how that happens, and we can't have ours go to a class. Yeah, there, there are many, many options. I think the shorter answer to the question is the dentists get a pass on all of this. And we're not so we're not as big as they are, as we all know, we're, we're the small profession, professional group We're the small board and we have to be more creative and more. Um, just more. <laughs> so I, I don't know that orthopedists have. I don't know many orthopedists. Well, some do have imaging, I guess, in their own offices. So they're going to be affected as well. Anybody is right that doesn't have send this person to a true radiology tech, you know, twelve month, twenty thousand dollar course. Um, so I suspect it's applied to them as well. Well, I do believe it that applies yeah. to them. The smaller offices, many of the larger groups do employ. Just in, in reality, many of the larger groups do employ um, only an X-ray tech, and and wouldn't be a just podiatric x-ray tech, it would be, they have to do whole body. So, and they're, you know, if they have a multi-specialty orthopedic group that keeps that person busier and it's more feasible. The, the practicality, of course, is also that uh, podiatry doesn't employ radiography for every single patient, many, but not all, but almost all orthopedics do. And subsequently, when you're talking about ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, backs, everything involved, you're more likely to be able to incorporate a limited XT or an extremity XT into your practice because they're taking dozens of X-rays a day versus uh, offices. Yeah, the, the, versus offices where there's one or two podiatrists or who might take a dozen X-rays in a day. So there, there's a there's a practicality there that is achievable in an orthopedic office, especially the group of four orthopods, which is more common than there is in podiatry offices. So we are rather unique in this niche that we're taking enough x-rays to make it difficult for the DPM supervisor to incorporate it into his or her day, but not so much that we can rationalize uh, um, from a financial point of view and XT. Um, were you given, were you sent um, to your office a notification regarding this or how did you find out about this? Well, we found out about, you mean, do you mean eight years ago? No, I mean like, well, recently, I guess, I guess right? So, I mean, did, were you, so these classes have stopped. I understand that because I remember when I was in private practice, and not in a group practice. Um, I sent my MA to some class. It was I don't. It was like nine hundred dollars or something. I don't know. But it it was you know it wasn't it wasn't easy. She had to study and take tests and it went on for months. And she ended up getting that certificate. So I mean I I, I understand those went away. But did those go away because the 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 radiology board said we're not going to do that anymore, or did those go away just because there's just no schools to provide it? Well, it went away because the, the radiologic health branch changed the regulation to no longer allow what that of course. So remember when you sent your MA and we sent all of our MAs too, um, it was a separate course offered by well, created by Dr. Stark, offered by podiatrists who were well trained and who had gone through it themselves. Um, but then they were no longer allowed to to um to, to use this course, it had to be one of the schools that are normally um, MA, multiple other educational programs, and then they simply didn't offer it. Yeah, so the radiology board feels that they didn't have enough oversight maybe to this thing, or they didn't want to be involved with it, or, you know, do we have any reasoning by from the radiology board why they decided to do this? Um, well, not, that's not that we believe is accurate. Um, and I'm sure that 
we can f definitely find you people and, and and dr lee is on the um the, the other board that talks to the on the radiologic health branch so you can discuss what the interactions are over there it's just that's more of a personal issue i think um but what they did present was nothing with regard to harm to the public nothing with regard to there being a difficulty in the, the course itself because those People did pass. It's a very rigorous exam, as you probably know. And so they passed. They passed the exam, so they they received the training. Right. And it was several. It was at least twelve entire days, and um, multiple um, days of studying as well. Right. No, I, I I listen. I'm totally with you here, and I think the board needs to do something to support this situation. I just am not at a loss of how to approach it. If you want the truth, like what. What could should we do? You know? Right, Judy. This is Brian Naslin, the exec. Um, I think right now it's just a discussion, and then there's got to be a, a lot of digging and a lot of uh, connecting and contacting. I think too, this might suit the federation. Russ Stoner, the executive director, and maybe query uh, <clears throat> the other states and see what they do. Yeah, it's a good. Um, so depending on how you guys want to take an action on this, um, I'm willing to do that. And uh, I believe um, Dr. Ball and Dr. Rubel, you're going to present to CPMA as well. That's correct. Uh, yes. Tomorrow um, is our House of Delegates, and it's already uh, presented as a resolution that we believe will pass. Um, we believe everyone is on board. We haven't encountered any um, resistance from anyone so far we've spoken to. But I, I wanted to go back. There was a question asked, uh, Dr. Manzi, I believe you asked a question of how this came to our knowledge. And I, I touched on it before, but let me reiter reiterate that through through my work as an expert and um, uh, and Dr. Ribbles as a consultant and speaking with numerous other uh, consultants and experts, speaking to people in the profession, uh, speaking to various people throughout the association, speaking with people who have been cited and fined. So this became, it raised its head uh, that we're aware of the problem, of course, because we're practicing DPMs, and it, it's difficult. So as we heard more and more people raising their hands saying, this is unfair, we used to have a remedy, and now this remedy that no longer is available to us. My understanding is it, when, when a statute is made or when there's a regulation employed, there has to be a remedy available. Um, and the remedy that was available at the time has been removed. It, it has vaporized over the years. So, you know, they've, they've essentially encouraged us all to become uh, violators of the statute if we do not um, either take our own x-rays or hire a tech. And again, because the reasons we've already delineated, this is highly impractical. impractical. So, it, although the, the information comes to you Anecdotally, it is uh, it's well known within the profession that we're we're all um, either employing XTs who sit around six out of eight hours of the day, or we're taking our own X-rays, which is a pain in the neck. I can tell you, um, and even those folks who say, "Well, I've got an XT right now," I suggest to them, "You are one resignation, one leave of absence, one pregnancy away from being in trouble." Um, you know, my office will take 12 to 20 x-rays a day between the two or three of us, and it, it's difficult to, to have to incorporate that in. Because normally, of course, when you're taking an x-ray, you're seeing another patient or setting up for a procedure or something else, and now you're in, involved hands-on with the taking of an x-ray. One thing that didn't get mentioned also is the vast majority of DPMs are digital, and that has made the taking of x-rays infinitely more um, simple to do. I mean, I know that RHB doesn't like to hear this, but it's a simpler process uh, for those who don't know how to take a podiatric x-ray. It's really pretty simple these days, and there's no processing involved. It's all digital. You can manipulate even a bad image into a good one because it's digitally um, enhanceable. So as the science has come a long way, they have still training us as if we're taking films like we did in the old days with old um, cassettes and old quality film and then processing them in a, in a tank. Um, this is like training a scuba diver uh, to use his own tanks and not have 
a, a dive compass or a buoyancy compensator the way it was 25 years ago. It's just not like that. The technology is infinitely, makes it infinitely easier to, to, to take these films and to get good quality films. So we have to bring the education up to where technology has made it so easy. And of course, they don't want to do that. In fact, they've gone the other way. Uh, yeah. Um, A comment? Yes. Go ahead. So for the other, for the non-professional board members, our office sent three people all the way to Orange County from Agoura, which is probably where the office was probably 60 or 70 miles away for a weekend course. So we would pay travel and overnight expenses. And all three of those people within a year or two, for one reason or another, left the practice. It's it's right. impossible, even when it was existing, to keep employees trained in, in this system, in the old system. There has to be an easier way. And so I'm very sympathetic to these to your arguments. There should be an online course, so many hours, pass a test, and they should be able to push buttons. Yeah. Full, uh, full agreement. Yeah, uh, we're not recommending that we have some sort of pass by like uh, dentistry, because I think that would very much rankle the RHB the way I understand it. What we're advocating for is a reasonable amount of didactic training, a reasonable amount of practical training, a reasonable amount, uh, a reasonable exam, and to be recertified in continuing education that is specifically for foot and ankle. Even leg podiatric includes the knee, which is much, much more complicated, and further up. Um, we believe we can come up with a uh, an online course uh, with safety to the public, that the technique is going to be employed um, so that there, there's great films taken and that certification process takes place, and that this could be a licensing issue for, for the Podiatric Medical Board, which is theoretically fiscal positive for y'all, and that we will still ensure pr uh, the protection of the public and an enhancement to the profession, which Dr. Rubel mentioned is at our core charge here. Maybe if we um, approached it like um, the, approaching the board of radiology and say, understanding that this is an integral part of podiatric medicine, we would like to maybe approve a program, you know, with them, you know, that would allow, like you're saying, um, this kind of limited musculoskeletal whatever um, test that they could, they could, we could provide, they could provide whatever. Um, to offer this thing, but I think that's not a bad idea. I just don't think that they're going to let us regulate anything radiographically. Unfortunately, we could try, but um, I can't. Well, it could, yes, I do want to mention the test already exists that a ART that administers the test for all X-ray techs in California. That the state has um, a, contracted with with ART to give those tests. The state doesn't give their own anymore. And there is a podiatric test that just is not being employed because there's no programs. So, so that, that already exists and it's really, you know, we could work with them as well. Obviously, we would need to, they would need to be part of the piece. But it, excuse me a second. It, can they still go take the test? No, not without passing the program. It's not like being an attorney where you can take them without having to go to school. So. Okay, well, um, this is Brian again. Does Dr. Lee have a comment on this? Hi, this is Dr. Lee. How are you? I've been Hi, listening Mark. to the discussion and I agree with Dr. Zapp as well. This is something that I'm very sympathetic uh, for the cause and I think it's worthwhile for our podiatric medical board to take a look into it. Um, obviously, this can add uh, or modify some of the mission of our podiatric medical board as another item, and that should, probably should be discussed. Any addition to certification or licensing overseeing for MA slash um, uh, leg podiatric uh, staff members uh, will probably add something to our uh, mission statement and part of uh, what the overseeing arch of the podiatric medical board will be. So um, I'll be interested also to hear what our uh, legal counsel has to say about that and as well as you from you as well, Brian. 
Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a ways down the road. We'd have to crunch, crunch the fiscal numbers on it, but anything that if we did take a, a licensure like that, I would have to look at it as uh, probably another PY. PY is a disposition uh, because I think Andrea is probably pretty much to her limit on other stuff and if we add a, another workload, which is which is fine, because if we get the extra income coming in, it would support a position to manage that uh, program. Um, I don't know if uh, Joe Chin wants to comment on this at all. Ed, this is the, I, I just, to my attention recently, so I, I'm just become familiar with it. As far as the process goes, uh, this is something that I think I'd have to work with um, uh, Brian and his staff, uh, along with uh, Red Council, and, and I, I agree with Brian. This is going to be a process that's going to take some time. But I think overall, having the discussion and uh, if you take an action on this, I'm, I would be really interested in reaching out to Russ uh, Stoner. Uh, the exec over at the Federation and pulling other states and just seeing what they're doing because I know they have uh, podiatric MAs, right? That designation in Texas or something like that. Um, but I didn't hear anything about x-ray, podiatric x-ray technicians. Um, but I'm sure there might be some out there and see what their model is. Um, but I think it's worth um, looking into and um, having a little task force to work on this project. So um, up to you guys on if you want to take action. And how about Maria or um, Darlene? Do you have any comment on this? Uh, this is Maria. I, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful that the issue has been brought forward. Um, I, I think that I agree with you, Brian, and that we just need to look at it a little bit more in terms of what the role of the board could be or what steps we want to take. Um, it'll be good to review either the regulations or the options. And, and after you talk to those other partners of our other states, it'd be good to kind of assess what is possible before making a final decision of where we want to move. Um, and I suggest that that might be a, a future topic of the next board meeting once, once that kind of initial groundwork is done. At least that's where I'm, I'm assessing where we are in terms of process and next steps. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. And Darlene, do you have a comment? Yeah, this is Darlene. Um, I also agree. I think maybe we look into an ad hoc committee that we can again have both our professional and our um, non-professional uh, licensees um, beyond, just so we have both perspective of consumer protection um, and looking at it as the podiatric doctors. Um, so I, I definitely agree and thank you for bringing this forward to our board um, and am very interested in the board of um, podiatric or, or the medical board um, and their take on this as well. Well, uh, I think that since, um, you know, Dr. Ball and Dr. Rubel have an incredible background knowledge of the ins and outs of this particular um, problem. I think somehow if they could uh, be continued with us in this discussion, it would uh, help it, it would help us immensely because I think they have pretty much um, all the pieces already there. And you know, I think that if we could somehow incorporate them in this this quest, it would be a good idea. And the only other thing I want to say is that I know you know for the lay people, I think this would be important thing to know. Um, I work at Kaiser, so of course we have our own radiology department, and that's so our, our my X-ray personal involved limited. However, I will say that out in the community, I do know that like um, at some of these medical centers, like he was saying, that if you practice around one of these medical centers, they do have independent X-ray um, places that they will send you. Like, oh, just go out the door and make a left in the radiology departments there or whatever and then it is all you know digital digital so they can get their x-ray you do have to send them out of the office it's very impractical but it can happen um, and I just wonder how much of this is a drive 
you know, for economic incentive, for not so much that you pay so much money for them to send these courses, because I don't think these courses are huge money makers, but just these independent radiology groups, I'm just wondering how much of it is, you know, pushed from that perspective, because it seems to me that that would be, you know, maybe that's their way of capturing more income by saying, no, can't take these in the office unless the doctor's doing it, because they know it's a huge encumbrance. I know that's looking a little like, oh, you know, conspiracy-ish, but, you know, it's something to think about. Three comments. Well, the, may, may the, I speak? the independent x-ray um, people, I, I have used them in the past, but discovered that they have no way of taking a weight-bearing lateral x-ray. And in one case, they were having patients stand on an x-ray table, um, which is crazy. It just doesn't work. They don't have the extra little facility to take weight-bearing x-rays. Um, second, there's a number of specialties. We have two physical therapists in our area that are hand surgeons, and they could certainly use a limited x-ray trained person for the hand. Um, and and uh, it would seem like we could gather together the the... The, the hand surgeons, foot surgeons, people with limited need and, you know, and get some kind of bill passed. Third, I can see that the radiology group will claim that there is a public health risk, but maybe we could send them an official request or letter asking if there's any evidence that anybody has ever been harmed from a podiatric x-ray unit. I suspect there's not. Um, may I speak, Derek Ball? Yes, please. Yeah, so, um, right. I think you are spot on insofar as what was the original incentive to the RHB. And even if we ascribe to them the most noble incentive of uh, public safety, again, we have no evidence whatsoever or that they ever even presented any information of the public being harmed by excessive x-rays. It's only theoretical. Secondarily, whereas one would wonder if you have to qui bono follow the money. Plain film radiography does not pay much at all. It's not a money maker. I'm sure the imaging centers that are taking plain film radiography would really rather not see the patient. My guess is, I don't know for a fact, but my guess is it's a loss leader for them. The processing of the patient, the scheduling of the patient, um, in order to take a $40 film or, or even less at Medi-Cal rates, uh, Medi-Cal rate for a foot film is $24. I mean, that's, that's hardly worth writing your name on a card for most centers or the processing fee. So, like I said, even if we ascribe the most noble intentions to the RHB's um, uh, original promulgation about these, uh, the, the training of our tax, that is long gone in the, uh, as, as plain film radiography became so inexpensive, but at the same time necessary. I mean, I, obviously, the, the lay people, we could tell you stories all day of DPMs who did not take an x-ray and sent a patient out with a potential fracture, for, but did not or could not take an x-ray and let a patient walk out the door with a fractured foot, and it went from uncomplicated to complicated. I mean, this is very common. Not being able to evaluate for osteomyelitis of a wound, not being able to determine if there is erosion of a bone, not being able to evaluate a patient at the time for osteoarthritis. I mean, the, the stories go on and on. And now what we're seeing is that many DPMs don't even purchase x-ray equipment because of the inherent cost associated with it. They've incorporated this terrible uh, caveat into their, into their daily lives where a patient is seen and evaluated, sent out, and then seen back after the x-ray is taken along with the report. Yeah. Um, that's not best practices. That's danger to the public. Yeah. I mean, I could not practice if I couldn't have instant x-rays. It just is, you know, it's ridiculous. I, I, I couldn't. I it couldn't practice. It's malpractice, in my opinion. So I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, there's, there's no way that, you know, to me, this is just like a blockade of some sort, and I'm not sure why. Except I just, I don't know. It must be the other thing too. Dr. Manzi, may I comment? Sure. Um, I think uh, definitely there's a need for some type of program or resolution in this matter for um, 
practicality purposes, but also more importantly for patient and public safety. Um, as it was presented before, um, the California Podiatric Medical Association is in the know of this condition, and I can sense that there is a lot of uh, leaders in CPMA who are engaged in this matter. Um, I would like to see if we can hear from their proposal and their resolutions on the table and present it to our board, and we can work with them in that matter as our next step forward, if that's agreeable. That was just my comment. Yes, I think that's a great idea. May I just add one more um, issue is um, put, CPMA um, has an embarrassment of riches is with regard to knowledgeable people. In, in fact, your own Neil Mansdorf, uh, former president of the PMB, um, who we have nothing but unmitigated respect for, um, is very knowledgeable about this subject. And we have Don Barati, uh, who practices up in the Valley, DPM, who is also very, very knowledgeable. In fact, she, she was, prior to becoming a podiatrist, a limited x-ray tech. So um, these things have been near and dear to their heart and they're extraordinarily knowledgeable about these issues. So we have resources to tap. Okay, this is Brian again. Uh, does anybody want to take action on this or do you want it to be tabled and come back or do you want to make a motion on this? Could I just say one thing before you make a motion or not? This is Yes, yeah, this is Carolyn. There you are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to clarify that what we're asking at this point is for the support of the board for moving forward on the issue, not for a specific uh, statement that you you support a um, statute change or or whatever what may be, um, because we don't know what's going to be the best thing to choose. But really, just that the board understands the issue um, and agrees that it needs to move forward, and that we will work but, together. And certainly, that um, the board would work with CPMA. Right, exactly. Just like we did on our last issue, um, we voted for me to work with Ryan Spencer and CPA or CPMA uh, right. to resolve something. So it'd be just a task force and it would just uh, um, give the board um, what what you guys are looking for. And I think we need, we need to put the framework back into this, right? We need to do right. some lot of studying. Uh, we need to see where it's going to go. What are the barricades? and come up with uh, positive uh, outcomes. So I think that's what the ask would probably be at this point. Thank you. So is the motion being sought is is basically for the board to approve continued uh, moving forward on the issue with and allocating and, and your time, Brian, to do that? Is that, am, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that would be it. It's just, um, I think I always bring agenda items that causes me more work, so <laughs> <laughs> might as well do it. Um, but I think it's a it's a critical component here, um, especially on the public safety uh, spectrum of it. And yeah. um, you know, so I, I think that's you're absolutely right, Maria. So if you want to craft a motion, something like that, or somebody else, feel free. Yeah. So so I'll, I'll move. I'll move to. To approve continued work on the issue, um, including with CPMA and others, uh, in search of a resolution and in the interest of of um, the health of the public. Okay. I'll second that motion. This is Macaloon. Do we have any discussion on that motion? And Kath Kathleen, can you read that motion back to us? Uh, the motion is to approve continued work on this issue and work with CPMA and other, I'm gonna add the word entities because I think you mean the Federation, but you read it and say CPMA and other entities. Uh, I'm sorry, Kathleen, this is the moderator. You are very muffled. Can you start over? And maybe get a little closer to your microphone. Okay, thank you. As I heard the motion, it states to approve continued work 
on this issue to work with CPMA. And I imagine the Federation should be added there. Am I correct? I don't know if you want to say and other entities in search of a resolution for the health of the public. Or I guess we could say for public health. <laughs> Did that hit the points you you were making? Uh, yes, Kathleen. Thank you, and and okay. and yes, include other entities in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we. We had somebody who was uh, who approved the motion. Cadenas made the motion and McAloon seconded. Okay. Discussion, I guess, and open it up to public comment. This is the moderator. We have opened the Q and A panel. If any member of our public has a comment on this item, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen. Type I would like to make a comment into the text field and submit that to the panelists. Seeing no requests, would you like me to close the panel? Yes, please close the panel. Okay, I think uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ball and Dr. Rubel. Yes, um, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Um, we'll try our hardest to support this in any way we can. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you to the board. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, Mr. Naslin has been extraordinary and accommodating and understanding and very comprehensive in his understanding of the issue and encouraging us to bring this forward um, without any bias, of course. And uh, we are lucky, lucky to have such an incredible EO. I hope I embarrassed you thoroughly, Brian. <laughs> well, oh, we, did. he has a big fan club and we love to hear it from other people as often as possible. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I think we do need to vote on the motion, though. Oh, right. yes, you're right. So um, if there's no take further the discussion, let's take a vote on the motion. Okay, here it goes. Dr. Manzi. Yes. Ms. Elliott. Yes. Ms. Cadenas. Yes. That was a yes, right? Um, I didn't hear it. I'm, is it yes? yes? That was a yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> Dr. Lee. Yes. Dr. McAloon? Yes. Dr. Zapp? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Motion passed. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. And now we're going to move on to the enforcement program. Update oh, possible action by Maria. I'm going to call on Kathleen Cooper to provide a summary of the report. Thank you, Ms. Katinas. Um, I'm filling in today and I hope I can get through this report without too many uh, incorrect uh, statistics. There's a lot here and I wanna draw everyone's attention to the written report. But in summary, um, this is a third quarter report, fiscal year third quarter, which is January to March, three months. And I think you'll see the theme throughout this report is that there is much less activity than the similar time last year, but the statistics show that it's taking longer to complete because of COVID. So everything's because of COVID. Um, the complaints, there were only 29 complaints during that three month period. For last year, there were 45. So that's a decrease of about 36%. Good news is it took a very short time, five days to assign or dismiss or close the cases. As far as the two types of investigations, desk or field, those are also down, um, a 20% decrease. 
in investigation daily, they heard about 180. It's an increased time of 32%. The field investigation, there were four that were assigned, eight were completed, and if you look at last year, for instance, there were eight, so it's half as many. But the processing time increased uh, very poor number of 175%, but everyone's understanding that this is vehicle. As far as the disciplinary data, there were no new cases initiated. There were three citations issued, and the average took 432 days. As far as probation cases, there were seven cases, and that's what you had at your last report. So there were no new probation cases. But if you look at the whole fiscal year, we're down about 30%. So we have a decrease in 30%. Um, as far as AG cases, there are 10 new disciplinary cases that were initiated by the Attorney General's office and six final orders. Compare that to last year, there were six initiated cases, so it's almost twice. Fortunately, again, the period to complete is 1,435 days when the recommended time is 540 days. So we're working on that as are all the boards. Um, as far as the fiscal year, I, I think I mentioned it is de decreased about 30% for the whole year. So 10 new disciplinary cases that came in that is still not compared to last year how bad it was. I mean, not bad. It's We don't really have that many cases, but this is just showing that COVID has had a big effect on the enforcement numbers. Um, the BREE system, I want to mention, has a new site that's available to all of you. And it's mentioned in the report under F, under the performance measures. And you can go to that site, link to it onto the report, and look and manip manipulate the data if you'd like to see it in a different way. So that's on, on part F of the report. As far as the probation cost and recovery, we did very well. We we took in almost forty four thousand uh, dollars last year. The same period, it was less than twenty, so it's forty three thousand seven hundred and fifty six dollars as opposed to eighteen thousand eight hundred and ninety nine dollars. So this is all great, um, and I think that's going to continue. Uh, people are paying on the cost recovery, and in uh, that's increasing. As far as the consultant and expert program, I'd just like to say that anyone who's listening to this that is a DPM and licensed in California, um, we would appreciate you contacting us if you have any interest in being a consultant or an expert. Right now, our enforcement, um, Bethany DeAngelis is working individually with people to train them and make them feel comfortable to be a consultant or expert, and it's not as hard as you may seem. Uh, you may think because uh, you do get the support from the board and the AG's office, et cetera. Um, I believe the report in the next quarter will show these same type of statistics where it's taking a little bit longer time, but there are many less statistics because maybe there's a little less treatment with COVID. But the statistics are all there to look at in the attachments. And if you have any questions, I'll, I could try to field those, although I'm no expert in this area. Any questions or comments? Uh, Joe, this is Joe. This is Brian. Do we have to um, do each item uh, for a vote, or we we can do it all at the end for the um, uh, executive officer's report? Right. So we. Um, we can do it all at the end. Uh, so the, the statute says um, for each agenda item, but if the board is going to take action on any particular uh, issue, then that that issue should be open for comment either before or during uh, the discussion, but prior to the vote. Okay. I always forget that. So would it make sense right now if there's to see if there's any comments from the public and thank you, Kathy, for doing You're that. Welcome. You're welcome.
Yes. Yes, yeah, so let's open for public comment. Okay. As the moderator, and again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please click on that Q&A icon on your screen and type, I would like to make a comment into the text box, submitting it to all panelists. Okay, I think you can close that and um, we can either wait at the end and vote them all in, or we can just take a vote now to um, accept this report. I think we can wait we until, the wait until the end. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, now we're going to move on to the legislative regulation program update and possible action. Dr. Zeff. This looks very similar to what we talked about at the committee meeting a couple weeks ago. So, Kathy, do you want to go over this one? Yes, I will. I will go over and I'd like to mention something about the report itself. Instead of attaching the full legislative bills, which can take hundreds of pages, um, this time, if you look at the report online, you can link to it. So I've linked each of these bills. So AB 97, for instance, if you tap that, you will go to Ledge Info, which has more updated information than I can give you in these reports. But also, if you'd like to look at who voted, which way, if your representative is supportive of what you feel is important, et cetera, you can see it all. And if anyone has any questions on how to manipulate that website, please give me a call and we could go through it together. But the reports are slightly different. And if there was something that was directly related to PMBC, I would still attach the hard copy. But these are indirectly related and are not included. So please, I need feedback if you would like all that paper when you receive the reports. But this is a new way to try to save on paper and yet give you all the information. So uh, AB 97, this affects podiatry in that the podiat podiatric devices that were not covered to prevent and treat diabetes will be mandated to be covered. And that does affect you when you're ordering things for people on, on various insurance or benefit plans that may be government related. Anything related to the insulin needs of, of uh, people that are challenged will be covered in this bill, including podiatric devices. So I thought that was relevant to your practice and important to all podiatrists in California. Um, that looks like it's going to go through. If anyone has any comments before I move on to the next bill, please let me know. AB 107 affects all licensees of DCA, and it just helps expedite a temporary license for an military, active military person's spouse or significant other. And we've been prepared with these bills for years. We've been getting them in the last, I'd say, four or five years. They pass some that affect some aspects of the licensing process and others that affect different aspects, but this is just a temporary license that I do not believe has affected us yet, um, but could in the future. Comment about this bill? Yes, yes. please. So I was thinking that there could be the situation where a podiatrist who would not be eligible for licensure in California because they perhaps never had a residency uh, the spouse might be transferred to California, we might have to make an exception to our regulations to allow that person to practice with a temporary license. You know, it's my understanding that all the qualifications still must be met. It's just that in, 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 not in our board, we don't delay, but for instance, the nursing board has had some issuing delays. And so this would force that person to be brought to the top. I don't think it means that they can get the temporary license if they're not able to complete the requirements. You know what I mean? Like if you need a residency in California and the podiatrist is married to a military person, they're still going to have to show that they're eligible for licensure. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. And that's true of AB 225, which is another bill on the same topic. 
and I just included both of those. If you'd like to read them for details, I say you can just click on the highlighted blue there with the number AB278, AB225. All right, I'll move on. Um, this Medi-Cal Podiatric Services, AB278, if you notice, it's, it's the second cycle that we're seeing this. And I think I heard, I was trying to find out why it's being held under submission. And it might be that some of the coding that's on a federal basis isn't complying with this. And so we may have to ask for changes in other areas beyond our jurisdiction to see if we can get this Medi-Cal Podiatric Services bill off the ground. But I don't think it's going to go this year. Yeah, I confirm, Mrs. Bryan, I confirm it's uh, on, on suspension right now. So we'll see. Um what pops up uh, next, next legislative cycle. And Brian and I have discussed the fact that this board wants to support this bill. However, this bill is not supportable right now. It's, it's not going anywhere. So we're aware of it. If it becomes active again, we'll send the letter of support. Okay. Um, the temporary permit for fluoroscopy, AB 356. It's interesting how it relates to our presentation moments ago, but it's slightly different in that this has something to do with out of state people coming in and being able to do that. I don't know what's behind that bill, but we saw this last cycle. It did not go forward and here it is again. And it looks like it will go forward because it's ordered to its third reading. So this is, a, is it a one-time temporary fluoroscopy pass almost as we were saying today that you will be able to get that done um, without having to learn how to run the whole machine and i think that was the challenge last time when we talked about it that to use the fluoroscopy fluoroscopy machines you don't have to be a technician in how they work but that's what the test is currently covering may i comment on that mm -hmm. yes please. um i believe the um this bill is more to do with giving the applicant uh, a temporary permit uh, in order to sit for a future test coming up for fluoroscopy as other states don't have necessarily this type of permit and regulations as California. And it seemed to be a pretty good fit for anybody coming into California, not having this type of permit or license to have a ter temporary while they are preparing and sitting in uh, for a future test. I see. Well, we'll report you how that bill continues and it looks like it is a good chance of passing. All right, um, SB 489 is not terribly relevant. The reason it was included in the committee meeting, and I did not link it here, but we can discuss it, is simply to say that under the Medical Practice Act, it defines licensees of the Medical Practice Act as MDs or DPMs. And that was kind of a nice shot in the arm to see that we're still listed in there, and I don't know what little changes they're making, but on the next, at the next board meeting, when it's finalized, I could give you an update on 489. Nothing is happening with that right now, and it's not listed in the current materials, but it is listed in the legislative update from the committee meeting. Um, AB 526 is the result of a lot of work from a lot of people, but it allows podiatrists uh, to provide the vaccines. And maybe, Brian, you'd like to comment on all that went into that? Or if anyone has any questions on that, it still requires training from the CDC and okay. certain pr procedures. So would this allow us to purchase the vaccine and give it to our staff or patients? You know, the yeah. CDC has regs so, so clear of what they need and it might be in there that I don't know how you purchase it, but I do know once you have the training, you're able to give it in your office. And I shouldn't even say that truly. I, I mean, I, I haven't read that you give it in your office or you go to a volunteer place. I'm not sure of those specifics. Maybe Brian, you have a comment. Um, 
Many comments is... while we wait for Brian. Yes. I think this is a huge bill uh, for our public health because it's allowing another sector of medical professionals to help with the pandemic and allow for more vaccination to take place. Um, as it is when the pandemic hit, uh, we needed more medical professionals to help not only uh, give the uh, shots in the arms, but also supervise uh, the delivery of this. And I think this will set us up much better for any future pandemic. And God forbid we don't have another one, but that's something that we never know, but this will protect our public health for the future uh, should anything else happen and be much more readily available. Sorry, everybody, I was muted. And um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Lee kind of covered everything I was going to say. I think this is a, a, a big win. It wiggled our way into the scope of practice. Um, it's um, uh, all vaccines. And if there's a national disaster or pandemic or anything, uh, DPMs would be allowed to uh, administer this. So um, I think it's a great win. This is Macklin. I have a question. Uh, Brian, you might know the answer to this. It says here that um, vaccine training provided through the CDC would qualify, but does, but are there also ways to qualify to be trained to give the vaccine? No, I think you have to do the California, um, the CDC. Um, it's the online course that everybody, when we got the waiver, for DPMs to give the COVID vaccine. They had mm -hmm. to take that uh, little online class. The only difference on this, this will count for CMEs. Uh, uh, okay, but in order yeah. to, in order for a DPM to prescribe and administer a flu shot or COVID vaccine, they have to do this online CDC training. Yes, yes, I think, uh, yeah, it's every two years. Uh, and and, and that it's would also a, qualify for CME. Yes. That's the way the bill reads. Okay. Right. Yeah. A slightly unrelated question. Can we administer tetanus vaccine or toxoid? Um, well, I would probably have to do some research on vaccines. Um, maybe have Joe do some research and see if tetanus qualifies that as a vaccine. It's not specified directly here, but that's a this doesn't say all vaccines, though. It just says these two. Yeah. Um, that I would have to research. I'm pretty sure that some podiatrists do keep tetanus in their office for, you know, rusty nail puncture wounds and things like that. Yeah, I would think. I would think so. I know. I was just wondering if we're technically allowed to do it. Yeah. I'll research it and, and get back to you. I think the difference in that case, uh, Mike, is that we are treating a podiatric problem, right? So I'm not going to be immunizing all my patients against tetanus, but if I have a patient come into my office with a foot-related injury, a puncture wound with a rusty nail, then I'm treating a foot problem by giving them a tetanus shot, which I, on my I understand. Opinion, that would has, be that been, yeah. has that been officially delineated? I don't think it has, but I'd have to research it. I don't think this is superseding um, wherever tetanus uh, shots for uh, foot uh, injuries is at. So right, that, would that have to be specifically in? Because we'd like to do anything that treats the, treats yeah. the foot. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know that it would be specifically delineated that we can give a tetanus shot. But, the tetanus mm. shot does not treat for the current condition. It's making sure they're ready for the next one. Hey, this is Joseph Chin, Board Council. Uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're talking about AB 526, this is, uh, I, I would say that uh, tetanus would not be uh, considered or contemplated within the intent of the statute. Uh, should it become statute, as this is um, being sought to be passed as an urgency statute, uh, which usually means that it is it has been created for a specific purpose to meet a specific need, and um, ex usually that would not be um, understood to expand the scope of, 
with an ordinary practice. Hi, this is Daniel Lee. I think I completely agree with that last statement. Um, I think the intent for the AB 526 was for disaster uh, as an emergency stature, um, such as the pandemic and COVID-19 and um, case by case scenarios like tetanus, which would be nice to have, um, will not be covered under this. Question, do we have an idea about when this might be passed and then be um, the current law? Well, in October, the governor will have signed it or not, if it gets to that point, and they can make it effective immediately or pre effective, you know, from that October period. So by August, end of August, all bills are. I think it's or the beginning of September, the first couple of days are finalized and we won't know exactly the wording that will pass, but this one, this one, I think is going to pass as is because they're having, you know, it's already at the third reading. It would be the end of August signed by the governor and effective probably immediately. So probably effective at the end of August is your estimate. Or when the governor signs it. Okay. Sometime between August and October. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking is um, if I'm presenting the um, board um, update to the CCMA House of Delegates tomorrow, and I have a feeling that um, that information might be requested um, to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we expect between the end of August and October to this to go into place. Yes. To be enacted. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Not because I, I want to pressure you, but because I want to. No, no. <laughs> no. This is how it is every year, you know. So. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's from legislative. So uh, do we have anything more? The regulatory update, just very quickly. Um, AB 2138 is at the Office of Administrative Law. They're making some updates. We are also working with DCA and um, we expect that by the next board meeting to be further along and we could give you updates as to where we're at. But right now we're just working on the language that they will accept. And I think you've all seen the document. There's a lot there. So um, as far as disciplinary guidelines, um, we'd have to ask Brian and we're going to work with legal, but uh, it is a pending matter that's been here for quite some time and we're aware of it and we hope to get it off the ground this year. Yeah, so as everybody knows, Clay Jackson retired, who was our regulatory attorney. Um, and so um, Heather, the supervisor, is is filling in for us. I brought this topic up to her, and I think they're looking for a replacement uh, regulated or regulation council for us to be dedicated to us. So um, I will um, keep you posted when we get that, and that's the next priority we have for the regulatory program. All right, very good. Do we have any discussion, any more discussion or questions on the legislative regulation uh, program update? I do, I have one more question. Sure. Um, do we know the current status of when we expect our sunset bill to be addressed? I think Brian's handling that in the executive yes. report. Yes. Yeah, I'll okay. give you an update. Uh, Fantastic, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and so therefore if there's, um, no more dis, um, questions from the board. Do we? Would you like to open this for public comment? This is the moderator. We've again opened our Q and A panel. If you'd like to make a comment, please click on the Q and A icon on your screen. Type "I would like to make a comment" into the text field and submit that to all panelists. Okay. I think we can close that. Will do. And now we're going to move on to public education. Uh, Darlene, I don't know if you have a report for us, but um, you're on. All right. Well, I was going to go ahead and have Kathleen work on this. Um, she has updated um, or a policy for us um, regarding submittals. So, Kathleen, if you could take it from here. Thank you, Miss Elliot. Okay. So, We've seen this before, and I'm sorry to have to represent it. We still haven't voted on it, but once we do, then this could be posted. 
and we can start trying to get articles. Um, if everyone agrees, and I think Brian and I are hopeful that a once a year publication, unless there's something urgent, um, would be adequate for our board. It would go up on the website and it would be along the lines of an annual report, even though we have an annual report with DCA, but you know, we could get a little bit more familiar with our specific things as it relates to the public and our licensees and other stakeholders. And each year, if we ended it at you know Halloween or Thanksgiving, or we picked a period of time, November X 15th or something, all ideas and articles should have an original submission at that point. Maybe we can close it at the end of the year and then we could get the publication out before the March meeting. The first meeting that we have or very close to it because we have everything in the fall and it, it just sounds to me like a great cycle. Um, the policy that's proposed is no different than you've seen at the last meeting, except I pulled one of the statement of editorial discretion to from the front to the bottom because I didn't want people thinking we were going to be criticizing or, you know, looking at the articles to see if their content was appropriate. I, I think we're going to have a hard time getting articles from DPMs, at least we have in the past. And so this policy encourages people to submit or to even submit articles that they've seen that they think are relevant. So they don't have to author them. They could just forward them. We would get permission and see if we could republish. Any scientific articles that came from DPMs are, could still be relevant, but it has to be something at the level that the public would understand. So basically we're asking for even opinions, but nothing controversial unless they give ideas for solutions. And you know, we, we took this policy from other policies of regulatory boards that we saw published and tried to make it applicable for ours. Um, your decisions are whether to accept the language, whether to have it as a once a year thing and what if the deadline you wanted to leave up to Brian, um, all that would be acceptable. But if we want to accept it, we should probably vote on this policy so that it can be published. Hi, this is Daniel Lee. Um, do we have a uh, proposed schedule of publications? Is it quarterly, monthly, annually, just annually? Annually is what we're suggesting, Brian, and I, we're having issues getting enough submissions for that, but also the way the year works, it would it would make sense to be able to write an end of year accomplishment more or less thing after the cycle is over, which tends to be, you know, October, we know what's passing legislatively and most of the regulations, any news. So uh, if Brian, you wanna pipe up here, uh, if you agree that it's, it, it annually would. Yeah, I think the annual, best. annually would be, okay for our small board um we can wrap it up like a um a summary of an annual report of legislation that passed um any significant events as we push out to social media and our website and uh listserv uh if anything comes up we push a lot of that information out um and then it gives us a little chance to to um, ask for some articles out there um some different uh maybe public articles as well um and put everything together it'd be a lot thicker than what we do now i, th I think that and then um post it on our website and really reduce the uh, carbon footprint of uh, you know ordering 300 uh bound newsletters that's pretty expensive and you know maybe just a handful gets sent out so that's kind of how I'm looking at it I don't know if Darlene wants to comment on anything may, may yeah. I suggest may I suggest oh. then one of the sections to include um, any the future of the um, uh, the bill for our COVID-19 vaccination because that's a huge public education article that we should definitely put it on and the reason I say that is because a lot of our patients sometimes just see us. It's a foot and ankle condition. They may not be seeing primary care or their <clears throat> other doctors on a regular basis. And this would definitely help out for COVID vaccination, uh, pandemic issues, uh, future of the COVID-19 booster shots. There's so many more things coming up and for our public to know, oh, I can get this vaccination at at my podiatrist's office. That'd be great. So yeah, we'll, we could do that. 
And as soon as that bill passes, we're going to push that out, put it on our website, listserv, social media. And uh, we might even do a little flyer and get it out to uh, our licensees. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so just, just to piggyback off of um, what Brian and Kathleen said. So the committee basically just kind of went back and forth. Um, again, making sure that we are hitting our public outreach goal and that we are protecting the consumer. Um, one of the things that we looked at is, again, how effective is sending out a publication for staff time since we are such a small or small board um, compared to the other boards. Um, and by doing a yearly and making an electronic, it's more of an annual report again that really highlights what we've worked on um, and especially our strategic plan and how that played a role into um, our goals and communicating it to our stakeholders. But we also have social media through the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, we also have news alerts and we do have a listserv. So those are the things that we know that we're still at least doing our public um, education outreach. Um, and that's why we kind of went to that the yearly would be probably the best avenue for for our um, staff. And I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. May I make uh, another um, comment recommendation for the footnote submission? Yes. Um, is it? Uh, I would like to see some type of section or perhaps a window or a page where we can uh, utilize our residents in our California programs to submit an article. They do have time. They would love to be involved about their experiences and how to educate the public. Um, have we done a page for our California residents to submit an article? Have we done some type of um write out essays or educational pieces that came from our residents licensees you know we've done students down at western we've had a couple publications with wonderful summaries of what it's like to be a podiatric medical student but residents i don't know i i was assuming they were all too busy but we should we could we certainly could try they've never submitted to me since i've been here but that's a great resource. I think it'll be to easy add. to contact the residency directors and you'll have, because based on the files that I've seen, we have 132 residents in California. Um, just having one or two of them write us a piece, I'm happy to edit and review all the quality of it, but I think that'll be very beneficial, not only to the board, but, but to our public in general, just to see the level of education and training that our residents are having. It sounds great. Thank Absolutely. you for volunteering to review the science part because we're not capable. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, send it well, to and me. To, and, and just to add again, if there's any articles, anything that needs to be submitted, Definitely, that, that's kind of the reason why this topic keeps coming up is um, we don't have enough content um, and writing articles is, uh, again, um, a, a very time or time <laughs> exorbitant to staff. And so if we can find people to write articles um, and submit them, that's why we're going to go do this um, submissions um, policy. And I want to add, if somebody wants what to write something, we will uh, help edit it. Sure. What I, I was going to add is if you're sending an email to all the residency directors, which we should have an email to all of them since they're paying our renewal fees anyway, uh, you have, you're, you're welcome to CC me if, you, if the board agrees for me to uh, review the article pieces, and I'll be happy to help with that. Okay, Dr. Leah, that sounds good. So if you like the policy, I think we need a motion that you, and I guess it could be at the end, but I'd prefer it be at this point so that I can publish this. Um, you know, that this was accepted. I think it's the third time we brought it before the board now. 
but we haven't voted yet. Okay, so I make a motion that we um, have a one a yearly publication for our um, uh, public education uh, uh, created, and this would this would be put both on the website and to be determined how many actual copies you want to print. Is that is that good enough motion? That sounds great. Is there a second? I second that, Macaloon. Okay. And can can I add to this motion? Sorry, I know that we're we're um, again talking about the policy, but really more for informative. And maybe this doesn't need to be part of the um, um, motion, but I would really like to hear from the Department of Consumer Affairs on how we work together to again. Um, send out our social media and what what we can do um, effectively or to, um, again, figure out where our resources can be best spent. Okay. Um, I guess that's part of the second part of the report on the social media accounts. And if we take a vote, then I want to make one comment on that aspect of the listserv. I, I'll just say it right now, Brian has been working with DCA to enhance our listserv, get more participants. Okay, so do you want to read back the motion, Kathleen? Okay, that the I can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. That you approve the publication policy and it will be a yearly publication updated to the website with various actual copies uh, to be produced as needed. I, I don't think you said as needed, but I, that would be up to Brian or administrative needs or something. We can finish it, but basically you're approving the policy with a yearly publication date. Yes. That basically what you're okay. Okay, so let's take a vote on this motion that we're going to have a yearly. Um, do we have to do public uh, comment? Oh, right, right. Can we open this up for public comment? My apologies, I could not find my mute button fast enough. <laughs> um, this is the moderator. We have again opened the Q&A panel. If you'd like to make a comment on this item, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen. Type I would like to make a comment into the text box and submit that to the panelists. And seeing none, would you like me to close the panel? Yes, please close the panel and let's um, take a vote on this motion. All right, Dr. Manzi. Yes. Ms. Elliott. Yes. Ms. Katana. Kathleen, this is the moderator. We can't hear you. Uh, Ms. Cadenas, did she say yes? I will, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee? Yes. Dr. McAloon? Yes. Dr. Zapp? Yes. Unanimous, it passes. Okay. All right, great. So um, now we're going to move on to executive management. Um, we're going to have an update and possible action. So um, I'm going to let Brian talk about the sunset hearing first. Okay, this is Brian again. Uh, sunset hearing, well, I still don't have any news. We know we have a vehicle bill. Um, today is the day where it, uh, everything uh, comes from the uh, stops from the Senate and goes to the Assembly. Um, they're still working on what's going to be dropped in there. Uh, I can say that uh, there's good news on the probation disclosure, so we just have to see what it looks like in print. So that should be coming out. I'm hoping I say this every time and I'm checking every day, um, even checking with CPMA to see if they've heard anything and they haven't. Um, and we're all standing to stand by. So as soon as that happens, 
I will email you uh, the bill, and um, I'm sure in September we're going to have a lot of legislative stuff to talk about. So um, we're still in the standby mode as we have nothing in print yet on our sunset bill. So hopefully soon. Okay. Do we have any and, questions about the sunset bill for Brian? Okay. All right. And then item number two is I think Maria, you brought it up. You wanted to see the progress of our um, strategic plan. Well, here it is. And if you go to page, it's pretty much our strategic plan in the front. And if you go to page 10, and this is what Solid did for us as the uh, staff and myself went over and we put a, a action plan together. And so the action plan contains on starts on page 10. And this gives us the quarters, things were done, things are still ongoing. There's gonna be a lot of things in our strategic plan that are gonna be ongoing because they just repeat themselves over and over again. But um, the catch all this whole thing was COVID, you know, for a year or so. And so we did accomplish to do quite a bit. And we're still going to accomplish quite a bit as we move on to the quarters. So I hope, Maria, this kind of gives you a little guidance. And I think, Darlene, you also brought this up, too. Um, it just gives me um, a plan. Rather, this not you know, usually people just make a strategic plan and it just goes on the shelf, right? This is my tracker. So we took an extra step um, to put this together. Does anybody have any questions on it? I just want to say that this was excellently done and I really appreciate it. It's a really great tool to have. And yeah, and we included this in our sunset uh, report um, as well. And I did get comments back as like, this is really cool that you didn't have any questions about your strategic plan and how you're managing it because you presented this report. So, well, there's so many moving parts that, you know, this is the nicest thing about this because it's like, yes, it just keeps you right on task to see if you're getting something done or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in 2022, we get to start a new one. So I guess everybody, if we can fly by then, hopefully we can, we'll be up at solid again, putting together a new strategic plan for the next couple of years. Yeah. Brian, since it is 2022, when does the planning start for the um, next strategic plan? <sighs> Actually, Solo will reach out to me when they're ready. I reached out to them and requested that we uh, continue using Solid for a strategic plan. So they got me on the calendar. I just don't know when that date is. So they'll reach back out to me and then I'll be communicating with them. And then once we figure out a date, um, then I'll start communicating with the board members. Um, so it could happen soon. Um, I'll reach back out to them and, and, and verify that. Um, to make sure uh, we're still on the list, but I'm pretty sure we are from my last email. And then we'll go ahead and do another action plan, which the board doesn't have to be involved in. Um, staff does though. Yeah. So it takes about a day, I think, day and a half to do the action plan. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And now the next thing was the board meeting expenses that we were going to review. And this is an eye opener. Yeah, this is something that I did a drill for DCA. It's it's not a budget didn't do this. We did it um, through our records of what a, a actual board meeting cost. They wanted it through uh, 2019 to 2020. So. When you take a look at this, it kind of opens your eyes. Back in March, if you hit the tab, I don't know if you guys are 
hitting the tab, uh, March of 2019. We were in full board meeting. We met, right? The flights are there. The per diem is there. Uh, shipping costs are there. Uh, some people took Ubers. Um, lodging cost. Um, some people got lodging. So in this March 2019, it cost just about $3,000. And then when you go over to the next one, and I believe that is June 19th, this is where we had, um, I believe it was the meeting in uh, uh, Riverside. So uh, there was a couple of flights, mileage, people put in for mileage. And I remind you, if we go back to um, in-person, Make sure that you fill out your expense things, um, your TECs, and give us exactly uh, what you what you use there. But you look at for the board members, it was uh, about twenty three hundred dollars, and for staff, it was about mm, nineteen hundred dollars. So you combine those, and you're saying, okay, you know, that's a good chunk of change just to have a board meeting, right? And it kind of goes the same with September. 2019, you know, about $1,800 there. Um, and we go to December, about the same 20 or $1,200 there. Um, and then when we get to March 20, that's our last time we had a, a in-person board meeting, right? So about $1,500 there. Now, when we went to the COVID and started doing things, uh, via the WebEx, $680, one shipping charge, because most people now like their reports uh, submitted uh, to them electronically. And all you're, all you're getting um, paid for is your per diem, your 100 big bucks a day, right, for a board meeting. So you see the significant drop of um, using the WebEx. And so it just continues down and down. So I just wanted to... It's kind of a crude um, document. I'm going to have budgets really draft up a, um, a statistical one for me, and we'll have better statistics. But it's just an eye-opener when you start looking at the budget, right? If we didn't get our fee increases, um, you know, and we still had in-person board meetings, we'd probably get hit pretty hard. But, you know, with the uh, WebEx, we don't. And I know everybody likes to meet in person. I do, too. Um, and I don't know what the future is going to be on WebEx. As soon as all the executive orders lift, and I don't know when that's going to be, uh, we might have to go back to in-person meetings, one in Southern California and uh, uh, three of them in Northern California, or maybe uh, one, uh, one of them on the coast at the schools in Oakland. So um, it just gives you a picture of rather than, you know, the budget, and you know those hard to read numbers and spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff it just gives you a, a snapshot look of what it is i understand there's legislation right now trying to amend the bagley king act to allow webex meetings following that um and we'll see how that goes but that's all i wanted to bring to your attention when i when we did this drill i was kind of like whoa okay kind of different you know, if we do do go back to in-person meetings, maybe we can do one in-person meeting and some WebEx if they allow it, if Bagley King, King allows it. And I think a lot of boards are, are recognizing the cost savings, especially bigger boards when they have, you know, two to three day meetings and uh, bigger um, board members, uh, more number of board members, um, it gets pretty costly. And all of our board meetings, um, we've had the luxury of not getting a hotel and spending for a, um, a room uh, to, to hear our, our board meetings. Everything we, we sought out has been free to offer. So that's a huge cost savings too. One comment, I was looking at other boards and a lot of them have just afternoon meetings. If you mm -hmm. have meetings say from 12 to five or 11 to 4 
probably people could fly up in the morning rather than have to come up the day before. And everybody in Southern California always makes our Sacramento board meetings by flying up in the morning. Um, yeah. I mean, the staff's allowed to get up that early or not. But we, yeah. Could, yeah. we could hold the meetings close to an airport and mm -hmm. meet a little later. Yeah. Uh, so in September's, when we get to future agenda items, September's uh, meeting, that's when we're going to pick new uh, uh, official uh, seats, president, vice president, secretary, and uh, new committee me members. And we're going to pick the dates of the uh, of uh, 2022 locations and board meetings. So hopefully we'll know more about the, the Bagley King um, amendment. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of boards that meet on Saturdays. There's a lot of boards that meet. Oh, you you take NBC, they meet, um, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning. They have committee meetings and they have their two day board meetings. And you know, um, some of the smaller boards um, they do meet at uh, in in the afternoon. So. Just a quick question. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for producing uh, this data. I think it speaks uh, very loudly. Um, I'm just curious as far as you and the staff during the last year and a half with the pandemic and doing online uh, meetings and so forth. Um, have you found any consensus as to uh, the liking? Uh, online versus in person or uh, yeah, I, I do care for your safety and for your health as well. Right. So I'm curious to see what, what yeah, your I think point staff, of view. I think all, all the staff um, enjoy the WebEx because, um, you know, they don't have to, let's say, travel or um, it just seems more convenient with them, especially with the Andrea and licensing. She gives her report and then, you know, she's sitting through with the whole meeting, um, which her topic's already done. So she can um, work on other projects via, uh, you know, listen to it on the uh, WebEx and rather than sitting through a, through a board meeting. And I think it has, has its benefits. Um, we're going to get new computers, hopefully with cameras. Um, and that if we do continue with uh, WebEx meetings, um, I think a camera would show a little more interaction. So um, yeah, we'll just, I think staff enjoys the, the WebEx. And um, one of the biggest things is we haven't missed a meeting since COVID. So that's, that's huge especially when the next sunset comes up, when we fulfill that fulfillment of, did we not have a board meeting and why? Or no, nope, we had a board meeting, we used a different platform to hold our official business. I think that's huge. And this is me, I'm in Sacramento and I'm, and I, and I'm saying that to, to, to you and to the staff, because I would favor even WebEx, even with me being here, locally next to you. Um, I'm favoring that. So uh, kudos. Thank you for putting this data together. Okay. So I will keep you posted on the Bagley King Amendment. I don't know if Joe knows anything about that. Um, I think it's we're, we're wiggling its way through, I, I think. Um, I haven't heard a whole lot about it, but we'll, I'll keep you posted on that. All right. That's all I have to present to you. All right. So, um, do I? Would you like to open the forum for any comments on the executive management opportunity? This is the moderator. I see Dr. Zapp has his hand up. Oh, okay. Did I lose you guys? No, we're still here. Oh. Okay, Dr. Zapf has lowered his hand. Um, well, I have opened the Q&A panel for public comment on this item. If anyone would like to make a comment, please click on that Q&A icon on your screen. Type, I would like to make a comment into the text field and submit that to the panelists. Okay, I and think. Seeing that, I will close it. Thank you. All right. 
So um, now I'd like to have someone make a motion to accept uh, the executive management update and the, um, I think it was the one other one we haven't voted in yet. Enforcement maybe? Update? It would be, it would be licensing enforcement. Okay. Be your so, yeah. form, just to accept the executive officer's report, which includes everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do I have a motion to accept? So move, Zaf. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second? Daniel Lee, second. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Kathleen, you want to take a vote? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. 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 Daniel. Yes. Dr. Lee. Yes. Dr. Mancaloon. Yes. Dr. Zapp. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Great. Okay. Um, so future agenda items. Um, does anyone have anything they would like to discuss here for our future agenda? Um, All right. Like I said, I'll put on there the um, the election of the uh, new officers. Okay. So that we we can get all the paperwork and the stamps and all that um, by December January. That was it takes. And then uh, waiting on the locations of the meetings, depending on if we have uh, uh, executive order lifted and a Bagley King amendment. All right. Okay. Um, all right, sounds good. And I, I just wanted to, um, so as we know it right now, since we haven't had anything lifted, our next meeting most likely will be WebEx because it would be in- um, September 17th. 17th, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and to be uh, determined. Caroline's going to present for us tomorrow, right, Caroline? At, um, yeah. at the House of Delegates. So um, I suspect that it would be nice if you gave us a little update on that, I guess, uh, on the sure. next sure. next meeting it would be good to know. All right. All right. So. Um, if there's no other discussion here, we can um, move to adjourn. Do I have a motion? Or does anyone have anything else they want to add to this meeting? So moved. I move to adjourn. Okay. Who All made right. that motion? I'm sorry. Who made Cadenas made the motion. Thank you. All right, do I have a second? Second. Yeah. All right. Well, until we all meet again, this meeting is officially adjourned. And thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate it. Do we have it. to do we have to take a vote on it? Oh, sorry. I don't okay. know. Dr. Manzi? Yes. Ms. Elliott? Yes. Ms. Cadenas? Yes. Dr. Lee? Yes. Dr. McAloon? Yes. Dr. Zapp. Yes. Thank you. Passes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you have a peaceful and restful summer. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Take care. Stay safe. Take care. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye-bye.